This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to Congregation B'nai B'rith. I'm Rabbi Steve Cohen. I particularly want to welcome anyone who has not been here before. Uh, it's great to have you all here. It's wonderful to have a, a, a nice full house tonight for a, a very wonderful, um, exciting evening. Um, before I introduce our, our guest speaker, I would like to just let you all know a little bit about the Taubman Symposium in Jewish Studies. This is a treasure for our community, for our Jewish community here in Santa Barbara, but really for the entire community. It's been going on now for over 20 years. Uh, our, the coordinator of the Taubman Symposium in Jewish Studies is Leonard Wallach, and I just want to <laughs> make sure that everybody understands that we owe a huge debt of gratitude to Leonard for really bringing major speakers from all over the world to Santa Barbara. And it's, it's thanks to the generosity of the Taubman Foundation and to Leonard's real organizational brilliance um, that we have this program every year. And I also want to thank and recognize the chairman of the program committee has been ever since its foundation, um, Professor Richard Hecht back there. And I want to welcome um, students of Professor Hecht. Every, uh, we always have a wonderful representation of, of students that Professor Hecht encourages to come to these talks, and you guys are the most important people here tonight. So, our speaker um, let me know that as far as she was concerned, a brief introduction would be fine. So let me just say this. Uh, where? Oh, <laughs> I'm looking. Rhoda Coleman, I was our speaker. To, no. <laughs> um, let me just say this. Um, Ruth Weiss was, up until two years ago, the Martin Peretz Professor of Yiddish Literature at Harvard. She had been there for uh, two decades. She is, in my humble opinion, truly one of the great intellectual leaders of the Jewish world today. And we are truly, profoundly honored to have her speak to us tonight. Please welcome Ruth Weiss. Well, it's a... Uh, um a, a privilege as well as a pleasure to be here with you. This is an amazing community as far as I've been able to see, and I wish I could spend a great deal of time here among you. Um, and uh, thank you so much to Leonard Wallach and to Rabbi Cohn and to Professor Hecht and to all of you um, for having me here. The fact of the matter is that I was asked to speak about my book, No Joke, which I'm happy to do, and many people have said nice things about it, but before I begin, I should warn you that if you go on Amazon, you will also find a minority opinion. Uh, one person has posted that actually what you should do with this book is put it in your medicine cabinet for the days when you have insomnia. <laughs> and so... Uh, this is, I hope that people, this will not discourage you from perhaps buying the book and reading it, but I just want you to know that that is an opinion out there. So I will start uh, the same way as I start this book, by telling you that once, uh, many years ago, I guess it must be about 15 years ago at this point, I was speaking to a synagogue audience like this, and when I finished, a man came over and said to me, I very much enjoyed your talk, 
and I want to give you a gift. And the gift that he gave me was a new joke. Now, uh, if you are in the business of collecting these kinds of things, you will know that new jokes are very hard to find. It doesn't stay new for very long, and so many of you may know this, but at the time, I knew this was a new joke. So the next day, when I was at Harvard and I was collecting my mail in the office of where the Jewish Studies program meets, I ran into two of my colleagues. I couldn't help myself. I said, do I have something for you? And I told them this. Four Europeans go hiking together in the mountains, and they run out of food. They get lost. They run out of food. They run out of water. And the Brit says, I am so thirsty. I must have tea. And the Frenchman says, I am so thirsty, I must have wine. <laughs> you see, you know it, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> and the German says, I am so thirsty, I must have beer. And the Jew says, I am so thirsty, I must have diabetes. <laughs> so, this is a... If you're not a natural joke teller, as I am not, you will know what a thrill it is to be able to tell a joke and to have people laugh. We have to think of what a wonderful thing this is, why it is so interesting. Um, and I was really gratified, and it was a good moment. And then my colleagues left the office, and I was about to leave the office, and the receptionist stopped me, and she said, do you mind staying for a minute? I have to ask you something. Um, and this, by the way, is a young woman whom, with whom I had often discussed literature. She wasn't a registered student, but she was a good reader, and we'd often talked about things. She said, you know, I'm really troubled. First of all, I don't understand what was funny. <laughs> and, and then she said, if you weren't all Jewish, I would have thought it was anti-Semitic. <laughs> so this is, uh, I, I was a little stunned. But I, um, uh, I said, okay, I will try to explain it. I said, well, you know, if you're troubled by the stereotypes, you know, jokes deal in stereotypes. They have to work very quickly. They don't have time to explain. So everything, a mother-in-law is always the same thing. Are all mothers-in-law like that? No, but that's what a mother-in-law and a joke is. And in the same way, a Brit, characterized by this, a German, and the Jew is characterized by he has more anxieties of a different kind than everybody else, and so on. <laughs> Didn't look pleased, so I said, well, technically, here's how it works. So you have the word have, and it is used three times in a certain way, to have as to possess. I must have wine, beer, and the fourth time, which is what you expect in a joke, is that there will be a twist. So the fourth time, instead of you using the word have as to possess, the word have is used as to be afflicted by, like to have an illness. You see, if you start explaining jokes, believe me, <laughs> that everything goes out of it. So, and, and then I said, you know, I suppose that Jews in the European context have something to be anxious about. So maybe the joke was playing on that as well. But in any case, um, this made me think about it a lot, about what had happened in that office. And there are two things here that are really very interesting. One is the way in which that joke obviously created a community of feeling with me and my colleagues. You see, you're all a joke it's not something given to you. You have to figure it out. There is a, as Freud talks about, the work that goes into understanding a joke, getting a joke. So when everybody in a room gets a joke together, my God, you suddenly realize, hey, we are one. <laughs> There's something that unites us here. It's a very wonderful moment, a collective moment. However, in the same way that it organized us all, it also excludes because there's no worse feeling than to hear everybody else laughing at something, but you don't understand it, you don't get it. So the time that you feel most excluded from a group is when everybody gets a joke and you do not. So this is really a very profound instrument, this uh, idea of joking. And um, believe me, if I had known 
that this young woman would feel herself excluded, I don't think I would have told the joke in that public place. But it's just in America, you sort of assume that everybody gets everything. And so um, I, I, I just did it, but it turns out that it made the non-Jewish listener uncomfortable. And this is something about joking, that you have to know, and we, we do understand it, that, um, that it is sensitive. So it excludes and it includes, and there are many jokes of this kind, and I will uh, just share one other with you. Actually, this should be told. It happens sort of mid-December. Um, it never feels like mid-December in Santa Barbara, but and anyway, mid-December. And this is a flight to Israel, and it's about to land. And the captain says, this is your captain speaking. This is the culmination of El Al Flight 761, and we welcome you to Ben Gurion Airport in Tel Aviv. Please remain seated with your seat belts fastened until the plane is at a complete standstill and the seat belt signs have been turned off. And to those of you who are still seated, we wish you a Merry Christmas <laughs> and a Happy New Year. I think I should stop here. <laughs> So, you see, this is, so let's think about this a little bit. Uh, so, who is this joke making fun of? Uh, you see that this is a joke that Jews tell about themselves. And it only works when you tell it about yourself in this way. And it puts down the Jews in a way. It says, you see, you never listen to orders, you never wait, you never, you have, you're impatient, you're rude, and so forth. By the way, once when I told this, there was an Indian gentleman, Indian as from India, who said, oh yes, we tell a story like that um, about a plane landing in New Delhi, and um, the same thing happens. All the Indians get up quickly and the rest of the passengers are sitting there wondering what is happening and the stewardess comes over and she says, well, you see, this is a case of premature evacuation. <laughs> so, so you see, the Indians also think that they have this same quality of impatience. But the other side of it is there's a kind of pride to it too. Because, after all, when you say that uh, Israel is a startup nation and that Jews are really innovators and that they always strike out on you, it's the same qualities of not just sitting there in your seat and listening to orders, but also really being one step ahead of it. So there's this double quality about joking about oneself. Almost always, the joke at one's own expense is also a joke that in some way um, establishes something important about oneself. Now, the great master of analysis of joking is Sigmund Freud. And one of the most breathtaking books on the subject is his very technical book, Jokes and Their Relation to the Unconscious. Um, he wrote this and it was published in 1905. And it's a marvelous collection of jokes. Most of the jokes in that collection are Jewish jokes. But he is not interested in that. He is interested in the dynamics of how the joke works. For example, condensation accompanied by slight modification. It's all terminology like that. It's very intriguing, but it's about the techniques of jokes, and how the technique of jokes, as far as he was concerned, resembled the technique of dream work, which is what he was interested in at the same time. And then, in the middle of this, I guess Freud must have realized that all these jokes that he was drawing on are really from the Jewish repertoire. So he writes, incidentally, I do not know whether there are many other instances of a people making fun to such a degree of its own character. Incidentally, isn't that interesting? Sort of like by the way. Well, what's by the way to him is a thing that most interests me and interests many of us. What do you mean incidentally? The interesting thing here is he does not know of, and in fact nobody else knows of, um, 
There are many instances of a people making fun to such a degree of its own character. And by the way, this becomes, he wrote this in 1905, it was just a sentence then. But when you see that there are civilizations who kill people for joking, right? I mean, you just have to draw a caricature of Mohammed and off goes your head, right? Uh, uh, so this is not native to every people to make fun of itself. And here he is saying that Jews make fun of themselves more than other people do. So where does this tendency originate and what purpose does it serve? Why is this so prevalent and continues to be prevalent um, among certain elements of uh, uh, certain aspects of Jewish behavior and within certain uh, kinds of Jewish communities? So some people would say, look, let's look at the source from the very beginning. It starts with Sarah in the Bible, Genesis, in the book, in the Bible. God's messengers come to inform Abraham that she will bear a child. And here's what the Bible tells us. Sarah was listening at the entrance to the tent, which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in years. Sarah had stopped having the periods of women. And Sarah laughed to herself, saying, Now that I am withered, am I to have enjoyment with my husband so old? <laughs> I didn't make this up. This is, this, is, this is the book of Genesis, right? So this is, she, it's not even about having the child, right? It's about having intercourse with her husband at this point. And she laughs at the absurdity of a woman who is past menopause, and she laughs because it seems preposterous to her. By the way, Joseph Epstein, whom you may know of, he is a great master of humor, and he says, so you see, we did not have to wait for Philip Roth to have joking about erectile dysfunction. <laughs> so, but seriously, what is it here that is at work? I think that what you have that's here is the balance between faith in divine promise and skepticism that derives from the biological facts of life. She is a believer in what God's messenger has to tell her. But on the other hand, is she to doubt what she knows about biology, what she knows about her own body? So this is constantly there. If you f now flash forward, to uh, Sholem Aleichem and his greatest character, Tevye the Dairyman, who is, as you probably know, the, 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 the hero of Fiddler on the Roof. Tevye, in the first chapter of that masterpiece by Sholem Aleichem, is in the forest, and he is coming back after a hard day's work, and it's time to daven mincha. It's time to say the prayers of mincha. The fact that there's no one else around and that he's alone in the forest doesn't stop him. And he prays. But this is how he prays. So he says, there I was running behind the wagon and singing the Shemenesre prayer like a cantor in the synagogue. Mechalkel chayim b'chesed, who provideth life with his bounty. It better be all of life, do you hear me? Re'eno be'onyeinu, see us in our affliction. Take a good look at us poor folk slaving away and do something about it because if you don't, who do you think will? Rifaenu v'nerofe, heal our wounds and make us whole. Please, concentrate on the healing because the wounds we already have. <laughs> and so it goes. So his prayer is really a seesaw between faith and protest because he recognizes that the gap between the promise of the prayer and the opposite condition of his life are so great that in order to hold them together, he has to do it in this internal dialogue. It's really not internal, it's with God, but the fact is it's all coming out of his own mouth as prayer. Very similar, I think, to what you see in Sarah. That yes, you have perfect faith in God, Perfect faith in God. It is what keeps the Jewish people together. On the other hand, look at the discrepancy. Look at the, uh, look at the incongruity. Now, humor is all about incongruity. And look at the incongruity. We'll just tell you it doesn't have to be uh, so high-minded. Um, I come from Montreal. I grew up in Montreal. And in Montreal, you have Sukkot. 
And Sukkot, you are saying you are living by the calendar of the land of Israel. So in the land of Israel, the holiday of Sukkot, which comes in the fall, uh, it makes perfect sense. You are praying for rain. You are praying for dew. And here you are sitting in the sukkah in Montreal, and the snow has just fallen through the sukkah onto your head. Well, this is incongruous, and you have to live with this incongruity. And this incongruity is the same incongruity which is found in the Jewish political condition. You know, you have Jews praying that next year they will be in the land of Israel. For 2,000 years, the land of Israel is second to God in Jewish liturgy and in Jewish faith. The land of Israel. But here, you are living abroad, in exile. Everything is different, not just the calendar, but the very conditions of your life are different. So there is this political incongruity. And by the way, this political incongruity is what I think the holiday of Purim is all about. Purim is the holiday where you read the book of Esther, and the book of Esther tells you that these two people, Mordechai and his relative Esther, these two people saved the Jews, right, from uh, certain annihilation at the hands of Haman and a king who was too distracted to pay much attention, Achashverosh. So the Jews were really going to be annihilated, something which happened all too often in Jewish history. But the book of Esther is a book about feasts, is a book about inversions, it's a book of comedy. And it, the comedy of the book of Esther is that everything turns out just great, it turns out fine. Well, that's why Jews have carnivals on Purim, and that's why everybody cross-dresses and dresses differently, and it's funny because it's funny. But there is some sense that, um, hey, this is very unusual. You know, this is, this is not really uh, what usually happens. And um, interestingly, in Yiddish literature, for example, one of the great poets of the 20th century, Itzik Manger, who came from Galicia originally, but then went to live in Warsaw, wrote in the 1930s his own Purim play. And in his own Purim play, he wanted to bring out this incongruity and it, make it a little bit stronger. Because in the 1930s, in Poland, the idea of the story of Esther coming to uh, life was very, very improbable, all too improbable. So he wrote uh, his uh, Purim leader, his version of the Purim story, and he created a character there, Fastrigosa. Fastrigosa is a Jewish tailor. Now this is all anachronistic, so it's funny already, but uh, Fastrigosa is a Jewish tailor who was in love with Esther, but Esther throws him over because she wants to marry the king. So Fastrigosa is there as your Polish Jew, you see, who tries to assassinate the king and is caught, and so he is sentenced to be hanged uh, for having tried to kill the king. Now this is all comedy. You're not laughing, but this is all comedy. And this was performed for Polish Jewry in Warsaw just uh, the, uh, until the 1938, 100 times this was performed for Polish Jewish audiences. This comedy of Fastrigosa in the Book of Esther, so that lest you think that the story turned out completely well, well, here's a character who sort of reminds you that, hey, uh, that would have been very improbable. So we have this political incongruity and many, many sayings like that. Jews said, is, Thou hast chosen us from among the nations. Why did you have to pick on the Jews? <laughs> right? um, or, Imru Ladonai, speak to the Lord and talk to the wall. You know, this is... <laughs> This, is, um, this was very much part of Yiddish humor, self-humor, self-mockery, because of the political incongruities of um, knowing that you are 
that you are designated as the chosen people. And nevertheless, look at the proof everywhere around you of being the target, the favored target, of the worst of uh, invaders and the worst of oppressors. And um, so this incongruity, I think, continues. And where is it, you know, who are the masters of Jewish humor? Uh, here's um, something to consider. In order to have this kind of humor, you have to be really not just invested, but the more you know, the more we all share of knowledge, the more um, sophisticated our humor can be. And when you're not part of it, when you're not in, in educated in it, the humor gets thinner and thinner. So that today when you go to a performance of um, the so-called Jewish comedians, um, you know, and you see Larry David, um, it's all about sex, uh, sexual innuendo, about uh, farting, it's all crude, it's all that, because there can't be any really internal Jewish humor, because who is he going to appeal to? Are we a knowledgeable Jewish community? Is it a knowledgeable American community? So the humor becomes coarsened, uh, and its subject becomes coarsened, mostly about sex and death, which are universal uh, phenomena, and so it becomes about that. But in the very orthodox Jewish community, the learned Jewish community, the joking is of a different kind, and we wouldn't understand most yeshivish joking. The joke, it's all on puns, it's, all, it's really very intriguing. But here is a joke that I heard recently, which is told in the name of Michael Wishagrad, the uh, recently deceased rabbi and philosopher, as related by Rabbi Meir Soloveitchik. So these are uh, great science of Jewish orthodoxy. And here, is the, here, is, here it is. So this is Frankfurt, Germany, Yom Kippur. We go back in time a little bit. And Jews are coming out of the Orthodox synagogue before Neila prayer, the concluding prayer of Yom Kippur. And they see the Jews in the Reform Temple across the street are already going home. Some of them are already eating the food that they brought with them. Hey, so one says to the other, go over and tell them it's not yet time. So the Reformed Jews, when they are told, say, oh, don't worry. Our rabbi told us that Judaism is about ethics. It's no great difference when you break the fast. Don't get too nervous. I mean, <laughs> I know this is a reform synagogue, so there's not. Uh, so the rabbi told us that Judaism is about ethics. There's no great difference when you break the fast. Be sure that you live an upright and honest life and do right by everyone. That is your Jewish mandate. The Orthodox Jew goes back to his friend across the street and he says, those foolish reform Jews, for two hours more of not eating, they have to undertake to be ethical all year round. <laughs> So this is a joke. It's not told by Reformed Jews, and it wouldn't, you know, wouldn't be so nice if it were, but it is told about Orthodox Jews about themselves because they know that they are the ones who are most susceptible to the criticism of hypocrisy. Because when you aspire to uh, be a perfect Jew and to obey the laws 100% and so on, you are most susceptible to the accusation that you are falling short of that standard. And so they make this joke about themselves. So only those who aspire to halachic consistency can be accused of hypocrisy. And the joke makes the point better than others can make it for you. So here's another aspect of this. You joke about yourself because I'm sort of as if I'm saying to you, you think you can make fun of me? Anything you can do, I can do better. You know, I can make fun of myself much better than you can. So here are some of the social workings of Jewish humor. The psychological need for it when you maintain covenantal arrangements with the Almighty in the face of contrary evidence. And the self-mocking humor of an ethnic community that recognizes the inevitable gap between what they aspire to and what they manage to achieve. 
Now let me just say that not all humor is the same. So when you consult your humor manuals and you go back to the first person who really began to theorize about this, Aristotle, he says, the tragic plot should be pitiful and fearful because of the tragic error of the hero. And the comic plot should be ridiculous through the comic error of the protagonist. The error becomes ridiculous in comedy and not pitiful and not fearful because it is neither painful nor destructive. That is, it's without pathos. That's a whole different kind of humor. And that is what we would call the comedy of laughing at, making fun of those who understand less than we do or function less adeptly than we do. A person who, for example, slips on a banana peel uh, is always a, a function of, of uh, comedy. Somebody who goes through the same situation and trips over the same place again and again the second time you laugh, the third time you roar because it seems so funny. Something mechanical and crusted on the living, said another philosopher of humor. Now, Jews have this kind of humor in Chelm stories. So sometimes I'm asked, why didn't you write more about Chelm in your book? After all, isn't Chelm the fool's town of the Jews? It is. But the fool's town stories of Chelm are very similar to the fool's town stories of other peoples as well. And this is, a, and in the Jewish case, it is particularly people who are theoretically brilliant and practically ridiculous. So that's that kind. But this is not the kind of Jewish humor that I have been talking about here. Saul Bellow says just the opposite. He says that um, laughter and trembling, let me, let me quote this because this is um, quite a wonderful passage. Um, he says, this is Saul Bellow's uh, definition of what a Jewish story, of what Jewish storytelling would be like. Laughter and trembling are so curiously mingled that it is not easy to determine the relations between the two. At times, the laughter seems simply to restore the equilibrium of sanity. At times, the figures of the story or parable appear to invite or encourage trembling with the secret aim of overcoming it by means of laughter. Now, uh, this is laughter of a very, very high uh, nature. This is not the separation of tragedy on the one hand, comedy on the other, as Aristotle would have it, but this is the fusion of laughter and awe, of tragedy and comedy, because the essential requirement of Jewish life that wants to live with a healthy balance between earthly and spiritual, between practical experience and cosmic responsibility, and the major point of Jewish humor is not laughing at others, although it does that too. It's mostly laughing at oneself, at one's own condition. So um, let, me just, uh, let me just say that uh, the... Um, one thing that I came up, my book actually, what, what it does is it tries to distinguish between various kinds of humor. So um, we have Jews in the German context, Jews in the Yiddish context, Jews in the English context, under Stalin and Hitler, and we have Israeli humor. And each chapter really deals with a different kind of humor, and one of my intentions was to show that what is funny to even one group of Jews is not necessarily equally funny to another. But it's always about this incompatibility. So let me just say here that um, what happened is somebody said to me, well, what about Israel? Uh, is there Jewish humor in Israel? And I started to ask people in Israel, Israeli friends, and I said to them, um, tell me about Jewish humor in Israel. And they said, there is no Jewish humor in Israel. There's Israeli humor, but it's not Jewish humor. And I was almost ready to buy it. But you see, a funny thing happened. They said that because the idea was that when the state of Israel was going to be created, there was not going to be incongruity any longer. 
the new Jews of Israel were going to build that wholesome, that society that would not be hated, that would not be uh, attacked any longer, that it would be a nation among all other nations. And if it's a nation among all other nations, where's the incongruity? The incongruity disappears. And so you wouldn't have that kind of humor. And in fact, in the Palmach generation, the generation of the creation of the state, and even the soldiering in, that, uh, in the 1940s, before the creation of the state and just after, you had things which did not sound at all like Jewish humor. Um, the rifle instructor is instructing new recruits all the time, and they come to him and they say, Lulik, you cannot say rifle, rifle, rifle all the time. You have to bring in a little bit more uh, background. Uh, you know, start with the Bible. Uh, you know, tell them more about that. So Lulik begins the next day and he says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Then came the rifle. This is the rifle. <laughs> Different kind of humor, right? So this was said in order to show that there is no humor. All right, fast forward. My sister-in-law came back from Israel um, at a certain point, and she told me about this story that was told that had people on the floors with laughter. They were rolling on the floor with laughter. And here is what she told me. There is a suicide bombing in a cafe in Tel Aviv. What, you're not laughing? <laughs> but you know how many Jewish jokes start? There was a pogrom in Kishinev. There was a pogrom. Many, many, many Jewish jokes start with a pogrom. This is the starting point. So it starts in this way. There was a suicide bombing in Tel Aviv, and the woman in Jerusalem hears about it on the radio, and she calls up her cousin because the cafe that is bombed was right near the cousin's house. And she gets her cousin on the phone and she says, are you all all right? And the cousin says, yes, yes, thankfully we're all all right. And what about Anat, who is the teenager who hung out at that cafe? And the mother says, Anat, Anat is in Auschwitz. <laughs> Rolling on the floor with laughter. Now, what don't we know here? Of course, teenagers in Israel all take these trips in the summer. They take trips to Auschwitz, like, yeah, right, right. Uh, they don't have to take birthright trips to Israel. They take trips to Auschwitz to be told their history. So the punchline of this is, Anat, she's safe. She isn't safe. She's seen Polish death camps. What could be safer for a, for a, um, a, a Jewish child? So um, this is um, very, very uh, bitter, but this is Jewish humor. This is so much like so many of the other Jewish jokes. Because when I told this once to a colleague of mine from Israel, he had not heard this, and he was very shocked, because it is a very shocking kind of joke. Um, he thought for a minute, and he said, yes, yes, this is a, an Israeli who had come as a child from Germany to um, Israel. And he said, yes, yes, among uh, our parents' friends, they used to say about German Jews, um, the pessimists went to Palestine, the optimists went to Auschwitz. Right. The same turn, the same turn, right? That of course you understand that to be a pessimist meant that you understood that the Jews had no future. And if they had no future in Germany, then the pessimists had to go out and go to Palestine. But the optimists were the ones who felt that everything was going to be fine and everything was going to be good. And their optimism was rewarded by they went to Auschwitz. So um, this is, um, every, somebody said to me before and said, I'm so glad that you're talking about humor because we've had a lot of heavy talks before, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and, uh, and in fact, um, my feeling is that Jewish humor is really a way of coping with that heaviness. 
Uh, Jewish humor is really a necessary part of the Jewish psyche that wants to live with some kind of a balance. It does not want to become pessimistic. It does not want to give up its faith and its hope and its generative optimism. And on the other hand, it has to be realistic. It sees what is happening. And the discrepancy between that aspiration and the Jewish reality has not changed very much. Uh, it has not changed very much. And uh, for a while, it seemed as if the creation of the state of Israel was going to mean that the Jews had no enemies that could destroy them. Um, unfortunately, as soon as that changed, Jewish humor once more came into its own. So thank you. So we have time for some questions. Uh, yes, okay, hear? sure. Just, yes, love. How do I think Jewish humor is depicted now in uh, the movies? Well, um, if you're speaking about here in America, I mean, I think that what I tried to suggest is that the stuff of Jewish humor, you see, has become thinner and thinner. So um, the great age of Jewish humor in America was, of course, in the Borscht Belt. And, um, to me, one of the most surprising parts of my research was really about the Borscht Belt, because I had not realized what a fantastic role that played in the emergence of comedy in America, let alone among the Jews. The Borscht Belt refers to the hotels in the Catskills um, that became very popular for Jewish families who could finally get out of the city, mostly in the summers, but sometimes all year round. And um, it was called the Borscht Belt because Jews, well, because Borscht was supposed to be, you know, what you uh, um, were given in great quantities. So it turns out that it was not just Grossinger's and one or two other great hotels. There were about 600 smaller and larger hotels in the Catskills. And this is astonishing. They all had humor as one of the ways of keeping the guests happy. And the idea was that the tumbler, the guy who was creating all this comedy, not just in the evenings, but sometimes all day around, um, his job was to get your mind off the bad food and the bad accommodations. And so uh, these hotel owners would sometimes hire their nephews if they happened to be talented and so on. And the list of Jewish comedians who got their start in the Borscht Belt is really extraordinary. So this was in the 30s, and then radio came in. Now, radio was looking for people who could get on the air and do this kind of thing. These people were ready-made. They had been tumbling. They had been doing comedy for hours at a time. They were natural comedians by that time, professional comedians. And by the way, they would buy each other's jokes, steal each other's jokes. This was a profession of making this kind of humor. And then came television. So who did television use? Television also drew in these people, right, who had already become professional comedians. So there was a time um, not so long ago, I would say, as uh, recently as the 1970s, and maybe even into the 80s, when um, well over three quarters of the people in the United States who were in the business of comedy were Jews. And um, so this is huge, the contribution of Jews to humor. But um, that humor really, as I say, became really what it became. A uh, Sadie um, says to her husband, Jaime, um, close the window. It's cold in here. And uh, Jaime says, uh, it's cold out there, sorry, it's cold out there, Jaime says, and if I close the window, will it be warm out there? <laughs> this is, this is, that's the Borscht Belt. <laughs> so, thanks. Yes, sir. Uh, when, when you comment how the Marx Brothers uh, fit into this, the stories? 
Oh, that's so difficult for me to do on one foot. <laughs> uh, the Marx Brothers are really uh, strange. Of course, they fit into it with the language play, with the punning and all the rest of it, and also with the idiosyncratic part of it, and one would say the antisocial part of it. They are upending things all the time. They are really bad boys of, of, uh, of comedy, and using the kind of um, guy who walks weirdly and the Italian immigrant, they are using the outsider to poke fun at the insiders. So it's that kind of humor. Much less self-mockery than mockery of certain aspects of American life which seem too inflated to them. So it's deflation, I would say, yeah. Yes, okay, the woman there, and then, yeah. Uh, Woody Allen's humor is more philosophical and more cerebral, and it sounds, I mean, to some extent, it, it, it touches a chord that, is, that seems to come out of, out of uh, Jewish comedy. But um, I don't know, I think I'll pass on that. On, um, I would have to have my thoughts in better order. I'm sorry, I'll, I'll try to think of it within the next uh, couple of minutes. Um, so, yes, ma'am. Huh. Well, um, it's not new. You know, when Mencken wrote his um, study of the American language, this is in the 1920s, I think, he already had a tremendous body of Yiddish terms, which was part of the American language at that point. Um, and I don't think it has increased, <laughs> frankly. I don't think it has increased. So what do we get? Um, it's a very interesting question to tease out because one of the things that you get is all the words that have um, clusters of consonants which don't appear in English. So that the sound like S-C-H-N or S-C-H-L, this does not come up in English. So words like schlemiel, schlemazel, schnorrer, schlep, all these words sound so wonderful in juicier than you can imagine in, in um, English because the sounds are not there in English. So those words become very popular. Then Leo Rostin writes the joys of Yiddish, um, which really, uh, if, you've, if you've seen it, you see it, it, it pretends to be a dictionary, a dictionary of Yiddish terms which are translated into English. But the only explanations he gives are all comical. Um, he, he describes them with jokes, and he turns Yiddish into a comical language. So here's the problem. So the fact that you have words like um, um, ganif, right, that come into the English language, come into, by the way, universal language, that certain words are adopted and come into English, this is natural and this is wonderful. Um, but the problem, and certainly it's a problem for anyone who's in the field of Yiddish, people associate Yiddish with comedy. They think Yiddish is a funny language. And this is really troubling. So you've hit on something here, that the importation of these Yiddish terms into English is really an enrichment of the English language, and that's what it was felt to be. But the association of Jews with comedy and the association of the Yiddish language, which was the language of um, more Jews than have ever spoken a language at the same time in Jewish history. It was the language of 10 and a half million people. To associate Yiddish with comedy and to think that it is a comic language, this is a reduction of uh, something which has been allowed to happen for the sake of popularity, for the sake of, you know, the nice part about it. But I think that it has become problematic for us because Yiddish is by no means associated with comedy. The fact that it has in it this uh, um, gold mine and this amazing philosophic richness of being able to 
um, have a humor of this thickness, of this substantiality, this is its greatness, but to say that therefore Yiddish is a humorous language and that the Jews are funny and that they're expected to be funny, that's taking it a huge step forward and in a direction that I think that one does not want fully to go. And I know that our students find this all the time. We were speaking before about the fact that one of the first students I had at Harvard who honored in Yiddish, a magnificent student, went on to become a comedy writer in, as it happened, uh, a comedy writer in Hollywood. And when he got to Hollywood, um, the, uh, one of the heads of the studio said he wanted to call him in to ask him some questions about Yiddish. The guy got very nervous. He had just graduated with a BA. So he asked me if I would be in my office for the time of his interview in case a question came up that he couldn't answer. So I said, okay, sure, I would do that. So I sat in my office all that hour that he was being interviewed for this thing. And then he called very shamefacedly. And he said they wanted to know about schmuck. <laughs> so this is Hollywood. And uh, this is, I mean, and you know that very well. That, uh, but now I think, uh, you know, it, Yiddish, because of the people who've gone into the field of Yiddish, you have many serious students of Yiddish now, people who really want to know it, who want to know it at, at its best. And they are creating new things. For example, uh, some of my students have created a, something called Ingeweb, which is a Yiddish website which does, uh, deals in, it's in English mostly, but it's all translations from Yiddish, uh, material about Yiddish and so forth. Um, so, in a way, it's not all being reduced to comedy. Does anybody? Oh, please. Well, Freud drew on him, drew on uh, his theories, and developed them farther. Um, and Freud certainly was able to uh, theorize about the mechanics of humor in a certain way. Um, and if you read his book, I mean, I think it's fascinating for people who really want to understand, you know, for example, you drive a car. Do you necessarily know how the car works if you don't disassemble the engine? and put it together again for yourself, you don't know really how it goes. It, humor is the same way. You laugh at something, you use humor, you can even be an expert in humor, but you still don't really understand how it works. So it's valuable in that way. I'm sure there are things which are applicable. And when you see the mechanics of it, some people are really intrigued by this, and it is an intriguing subject. But then, uh, it is not the same thing as the philosophical contemplation of humor and really the differentiation between different kinds of humor. I'm not sure that all peoples are given to finding their moral equilibrium through humor to the same degree that Jews have been doing it for centuries, and that is different. And um, f doing it with painful subjects. For example, at the end of the 19th century, um, Jews in great numbers were converting to Christianity. We forget this. In America, you don't have to convert to Christianity to stop being Jewish. Everybody can stop being Jewish. Most people do stop being Jewish, and they don't have to convert. They just stop being Jewish. Uh, but in Europe, it was very different. There were things you couldn't get to do if you did not convert. So conversion was a very big deal. So one day, four, Jew four converts, four Jewish converts to Christianity are sitting and talking together. And um, the converts, um, say, one says, uh, uh, I converted because uh, I was 
caught and I was about to be imprisoned. And they gave me the choice of imprisonment or conversion. So of course I converted. And um, another one says, not me. Um, I was so angry with my parents who were so repressive and so awful that in order to spite them, I converted. The third one says, oh my goodness, I converted out of love. I fell in love with a Christian girl and the only way I could get to marry her was to convert, so I converted. And the fourth one says, I am really disturbed about this. I converted because Christianity was the greater religion. I, I converted out of faith. And they say, oh, go tell it to the goyim. <laughs> so, so this is a kind of, would you say, this is about as anti-Christian a joke as one can get in the Jewish tradition. So it makes fun of, but you see how much anxiety is in it. The whole anxiety of conversion, mass conversion is in it. Uh, but at the end, it gets its own little, uh, <laughs> it, its own comeback, right? It's its own little uh, gratification out of this through humor. So I think I'll stop there. Thank you very much. <laughs>